Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, redeeming love is is your theme. Father, we are yours because of your love for us. And your love has chased us down. It's taken us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of your Son. Your love brings dead people to life. Your love heals wounds. It's redeeming. And Father, I pray that having experienced that redemption and that redeeming love on a daily basis, that we as your people would pour that same kind of redeeming love out onto people all around us, especially one another. That's in your name I pray. Amen. John John 13 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. The concept of love is more than a sappy, romantic movie, or it's more than a Nicholas Sparks book or novel, right? Right? The virtue of love goes beyond a mere feeling, a euphoric relationship, an infatuation, an adoration, or just obsession. Love has substance. It's expressed by words and actions that are aligned and that are fueled by a deep abiding belief in the value of another person and taking joyful pleasure in the good of that person and their well-being. Not simply for what they can do for you. If there was a single double-edged motivation of the ministry of Paul, it was love. A love for God who had transformed his life and a love for people that God's love produces. Love for people marked by sacrifice, devotion, and selfless determination to share the gospel message of salvation in Christ Jesus so that others might experience the love of God. By that message alone, untainted and unedited, can anyone be saved? That's why for Paul, it will be a continual focus in his discipleship of the believers and church leaders that the message should be be guarded, kept pure, no additions, no subtractions. It should not be mixed up with man-made traditions and ideologies or constricted by improper teachings in misapplication of the Hebrew law, or in the case that's being addressed in the beginning of 1 Timothy as we step into a study of this book, study of this book, by confusing and empty speculation, conspiracies, word gymnastics that are smothering the gospel message. Romans 1.16, Paul says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation for all that believe. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So in other words, getting the truth out and keeping it pure and clear was absolutely necessary. Paul understood this. For the hopeful salvation of mankind and the restoration of people and the continued sanctification of God's redeemed. It was love for mankind that would create such a fervor and a determination to do just that. Even if it meant a lot of uncomfortable confrontations, pushbacks, hardships. And that should also be the same fervor and determination for all believers concerning the gospel and the handling of the word of God. This powerful love is is built on truth, not fantasies, not falsehoods, not lies, not misconceptions, which only produce fragile counterfeits of true love, rather than the love that God meant for us to experience both from him and from each other. This pure love is, is the nutrient that brings healing, it brings restoration. It it gives a strong sense of identity and worth to people. Connection is restored with people and with God. Confidence, growth and maturity, and magnetic unity and community in the family of God happens when this love is present. 
And here's the thing about love. Love comes in a lot of different expressions, right? I, I like the term people vitamins. Like, we all need people vitamins. And in every expression, all of these different ways that we give and that we receive love, that is what enables us to grow into the people that God has called us to be and is working in us to make us. And here's the cool thing. No pressure, but here's the way it goes. He is using one another for this outpouring and work of love. God's church is birthed, it's formed, it's unified, and it is identified by love. We're going to look today at 1 Timothy at the beginning of it. We're going to see five ways in this scripture that transforming love is expressed and experienced. Let me give you a little bit of backdrop to this letter to help us out. So Paul, if you you were with us through the study of Acts, you may recall some of this. Paul had a brief moment in Ephesus when he was hurrying to get to his work in Antioch. He left Priscilla and Aquila there, who no doubt had something to do with the birth and formation of the church in Ephesus. And then Paul is going to eventually, he's going to return, and he's going to give about three years of investment of his life into the church at Ephesus and help develop the gospel ministry in the church. And if you recall... God worked in such a powerful way in those years that he he did so many extraordinary things that the idol makers in Ephesus, this pagan society, began to lose business. And they started a riot, and they wanted to put an end to this talk of Jesus and the gospel. So Ephesus becomes like the command center for evangelization of Asia Minor. And knowing how important the church was in Ephesus, Paul gives a warning to the elders before he gets on his way. In Acts chapter 20, he says this to those elders. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. So come about five years later, Paul sits down and he pens a letter to the church at Ephesus Again, reminding them of who they were in Christ and how they were to function as the body of Christ and how love was to be the center nutrient that was going to build up the body to maturity and how leadership was put into place to help see that through. And then about six or seven years later, we get this this letter written to Timothy because just as Paul had feared and had warned, wolves are indeed in the sheepfold now. So then Paul sends Timothy to deal with the problems. It was a difficult task for the, most, the toughest, most stoic of leaders, let alone a humble, timid, young leader like Timothy. So Paul sends him a letter with emboldening and authoritative instructions about the church's conduct and leadership. So written with a heart of deep love and deep affection for Timothy, Paul begins the letter. He begins it like this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want to stop right there for a moment. I want to show you a few expressions of love that were emanating from Paul to Timothy and that Paul would instruct and call us on to exhibit among ourselves So one expression of love that you see right here first is we love by giving hopeful perspective. We love by giving hopeful perspective. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Paul's making the claim that his apostolic position was due to divine command. Paul sees himself as being commissioned by God. And so he's conveying to Timothy and to the other elders of the church that his teaching was authoritative. And if they would carry it out, that they could have confidence that the God of the universe would be the source of power in their actions and in their words. Because God backs up what he commands. 
So be of courage, Timothy. Paul says, he adds that, Jesus, or that Christ Jesus, our hope. That hope meant certain hope. Fully confident expectation of a reality that's not yet come, but will. This letter was written to raise Timothy's head. To give him support that he needed to do the elder work of protecting the purity of the gospel. To protect the output of transforming love that was built on truth among the family of God. If you read this, Paul's greeting and his, and his claim of authority, it wasn't fueled by arrogance. He's writing to Timothy, who knows him well. They've spent a lot of time together. It was a reminder to Timothy that God uses unqualified people. He uses the weak. He uses the sinner. People who the world would look, out and look at and say, no way, not him. So, Paul, so Timothy, knowing the testimony of Paul, knew that everything that Paul had ever accomplished wasn't done because Paul was awesome. It was accomplished because of the gracious work of God in and through the life of the Apostle Paul. As Paul himself would say, I am the chief of sinners. Paul wanted Timothy to keep this perspective that he, what he was doing in Ephesus and in his leadership, it wasn't expected of him to do it in his own power and his own talents. Didn't rest, it rested solely on the powerful and the gracious work of God in and through Timothy's life. Paul knew this about Timothy. That if, Paul, if Timothy held the perspective that this somehow had something to do with Timothy himself, like Timothy's awesomeness and his talents, his personality, that likely Timothy would tap out and shut down. Let me challenge you with this this morning, church. We are all prone to hold rigidly to our own perspectives. And it often limits us, keeps us stuck, keeps us from growing, keeps us from healing, keeps us from taking risks. It keeps us from succeeding. And these perspectives are often informed by past experiences of failures or pain or relationships, self-defeating beliefs where perhaps we feel that our personalities or our lack of talent or our family backgrounds limit us in some way or they define our outcomes already or they're these unscalable obstacles to success and maybe we have stifling beliefs about others or the world around us that have been developed over time that were informed by perhaps our upbringing or are developed uh, by our bad experiences or we've just held a steady diet of the world's diet of values and and lies and misinformation can I challenge you with this this morning our perspectives are not always right I know that hurts to hear our perspectives are not always right, and they're certainly not the only one. And as believers, as, as brothers and sisters, we need to constantly help one another challenge our perspectives on life and circumstances, on ourselves and on other people. And that starts by first and foremost saying, fix your eyes on God. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, our hope. Get your head unstuck from your own limited view and, and finite understanding and put your confidence in the God who saved you, who called you, and who will equip you for life ahead with every spiritual blessing. We're to love one another with a love that refuses to sit back and watch you stay stuck by fears and doubt in your following of God and experiencing of life. We are to keep hope in front of each other. Number two, we love by acceptance. Look at the the terms here, the way that Paul speaks to Timothy, he says, To Timothy, my true child in the faith. Now, Timothy, he has some personal characteristics that could easily have created obstacles for his willingness to step into this role, to take on this uncomfortable challenge of confronting other people. It was going to take boldness. It was going to take authority. These people were probably older than him, maybe more educated than him, maybe even had better standing with people than him. Who knows? But Paul's affection for him and Paul's belief in his abilities and his faithfulness, it no doubt was the shot that Timothy needed in his arm to go on and do what God had called him to do. A few things about Timothy. First of all, Timothy came from a mixed marriage. His mom was Jewish, but his father was a pagan Greek. He would be considered illegitimate by Jewish law. He was young when this letter was also written to him. He was young. There are several times that Paul points out his youth and has to say, hey, you're going to have to push past that and not let that become an obstacle to your leadership. On top of that, he was timid. Any timid folks in the house, you're not going to raise your hand, all right? 
That introversion, that, that shyness kicks in. Maybe it was insecurity because he knew that I'm, I'm of this mixed marriage. I'm, 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 not, you know, I don't, I'm not qualified. He also seemed to have a weak constitution and health about him. As Paul would address a stomach issue that he carried about with him. So he would say, drink a little wine instead of just water. Likely that was related to heightened anxiety and stress from being called to step in front of people and take the lead, which would have been very uncomfortable for his personality. Here's the thing we know about Timothy. He wasn't a missionary warrior type like Paul. He wasn't. He was, he was like a lot of us. And yet Paul loved him with fatherly affection. He accepted him. He accepts Timothy as he is. And he shows that love and affection. He assigns value to young Timothy. And guys, that kind of acceptance paves the way for people to grow and develop and become everything God wants them to be. I gave you a list there in your notes. I'm going to fly through this. This is, a, this is just an, some ideas about how that loving acceptance show, produces health and growth in people. This comes from How People Grow, uh, the book by Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend. Here's what I, some of this says. Loving acceptance is, first of all, an invitation. It's receiving someone into relationship. To, to be accepted is to have all of your parts, the good and the bad parts, received by another without condemnation. Acceptance is the result of grace at work. Because of God's grace, we're accepted into relationship with him. And that's how we're meant to experience God and how we're meant to experience one another. Acceptance also frees us from the bondage of the law. When we break the law, we don't lose relationship. In other words, we're forever in a state of acceptance. Acceptance does away with the need to prove ourselves worthy, and it replaces it with an appeal to living life on the basis of relationship rather than performance and good works. Acceptance builds trust and relationship. Acceptance develops safe, growth-producing relationships. Because we can't grow until unless we're sure that we are both known and loved. Acceptance creates safety to be able to experience ourselves. There's a lot of people who are stuck spiritually because they can't completely be themselves. There's parts of them that are wounded. There's parts of them that are, they're ashamed of, that there is guilt, they're guilt riddled with, whatever, and those parts are in hiding. They don't bring it into the open. So what acceptance does is it allows them and gives them permission to bring these things into light. So things that come to light would be like needs, needs that are unspoken, that they're not sharing, sins, the judged parts of themselves, their hiding styles, brokenness, weakness. Acceptance also creates safety to confess and heal. Gives the, the opportunity for you to do that as those things come to light, to confess them. And acceptance emboldens us to take risk for growth. Because when you're in an environment of no condemnation, people are finally free to bring out issues and deal with things in their life that need healing, that need work, that need growth. And that's what acceptance does. Number three. We love by approval, affirmation, and encouragement. Paul calls him my true child in the faith. And he does that to affirm his spiritual legitimacy as a disciple of Jesus, as a child of God. You see, Paul was a part of Timothy's coming to faith. He saw himself as a spiritual father to Timothy. He invested in Timothy, which showed Timothy that he approved of him. By putting Timothy in places of leadership, and putting confidence in Timothy's leadership, again, that would give approval to Timothy. Paul would always show affection and approval for Timothy in everything that he ever wrote where he included Timothy. In fact, in Corinthians, he says this, I am sending you Timothy, my son, whom I love. To the Philippians, he said about Timothy, as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. And the second letter that he writes to Timothy, he says to Timothy, Recalling your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. There is nothing like a father's approval in his son to boost courage to take on challenges. Nothing like it. Approval says this, it says, I believe in you. It says, I see the uniqueness of you, the good in you, the potential in you, and I find joy in what I see in you. What an encouragement it must have been to Timothy. Like a proud father, Paul is saying, I know you're the real deal. 
I believe in your ability to do the difficult things I'm asking you to do. Because I know you intimately, Timothy. I've spent time with you. I've invested in you. And I believe this to be true. There was a genuine love between Paul and Timothy. And also this letter would be, it was an open letter. So it affirmed Timothy's authority and his role in the church to anyone else that would read this letter. Paul gives his approval. Church, listen. We are to constantly, constantly affirm and encourage one another by reminding each other of our identity in Christ. Who we are, what the gospel has now made true of us. And of our membership in the family of God, our role in the family of God, our value to the family of God, our responsibility to the family of God. And we do it by, and we point to the resources of heaven that our faith in Christ has now given us based on the powerful working of God both in us and through our lives. We need this constantly. I'm going to come to, to one little moment here that I, I don't want to skip this. He calls him his child. That's a family term. And by the way, family, that's kind of the correct relational structure and perspective to take when you talk about the collective people of God, the children of God, brothers and sisters in the room with with God as our Father. And I just want to pause and say this. The church, in many ways, it serves as a corrective family experience for so many of us. The love established and shared among believers is meant to bring healing and connection and growth and it's, it's sanctification that God's working in us. And we all have a family of origin, right? You didn't get to choose that family. For many of us, we were blessed in many ways. We experienced good love. We were led by truth and grace and forgiveness. We were approved. We were accepted. Home was safe and warm. It wasn't perfect, but love was real and it was present. For others, home wasn't so great. It was shaky. Perhaps you felt your worth seemed tied to your performance. Words were weapons. Love was self-serving. We were led by wrong motives and perspectives. Perhaps unhealed past wounds guided your parents. Identity maybe was in material gains and achievements. Forgiveness was not easily given or received. Anger ruled in the home. Separation and secrets filled the house, and perhaps that was your experience. Thanks be to God that though that might be your family of origin type stories and those things might have been woven in there, God gives us his family, a family with a new father, a father who is loving us and restoring us, who's putting truth you know, in front of us and in us, who gathers us together, and we find ourselves living from love and not for love. We're led by, by truth and he's teaching us to, to experience one another differently to love differently, to respond differently. And God is doing a great work of taking all those broken things and making them good and whole. Timothy had a faithful, believing mother and grandmother, but he had a pagan father. And I can't help but to think, what a grace of God to give Timothy the experience of being loved and led and nurtured by the Apostle Paul as a spiritual father figure, who, by the way, himself had experienced the love and acceptance of God through other believers who, who affirmed his identity in Christ. Guys, we need to do that for one another. We need to do that for our brothers and sisters, for everyone around us, that we affirm them, that we build them up, we encourage them, we give our approval. Proper love among us seeks to show that kind of affection, that kind of approval and encouragement. Number four, and I gotta go fast. If you don't get your blanks, I apologize. You can see me afterwards, all right? (laughs) We love with validation and comfort. He says this, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. See what love doesn't do? It doesn't shame a person for their wounds or their weakness or their immaturity or their shortcomings or their insecurities or their doubts. It acknowledges the realities of those parts of our lives. It empathizes with them. But it also offers truth that transcends it all to bring comfort and support and to strengthen us for growth in the days ahead. Namely, love points to God who holds us in his hand. 
See, here's what validation is. Validation conveys to a person that their experience is significant. It's not to be dismissed, minimized, or shamed. If you want to isolate another person, if you want to actually move them away from growth, if you want to move them away from healing, if you want to move them away from receiving grace, just invalidate their life experiences. Treat their feelings, their perspectives as inferior. Shame them for having the struggles that they are having. And I promise you, they'll never open their heart to receive the truth that you might be sharing, the grace, the forgiveness, the wisdom. It will shut them down, and it creates separation and disconnection. Validation doesn't mean that you're agreeing with everything, but it means that you're giving it significance, understanding, and care. Paul offers three blessings to Timothy, knowing what experiences he was having and would have. So he applies comforting truth to Timothy's coming trials and struggles, validating Timothy's concerns. Look at what he blessed Timothy with in his letter. Now, in all the other letters that Paul writes, he always says, grace and peace. But in the letters to Timothy, he offers grace, mercy, and peace. Grace was not just this uh, reminder of God's saving grace, but, but God's continued unmerited favor for living. He wanted Timothy to remember that God is always lovingly postured toward his children. That he takes pleasure in pouring blessings and gifts on his children. That God was for him, that he wasn't alone. He wanted Timothy to be equipped with grace for the ministry. Paul also blesses him with mercy. He, and mercy emphasizes God's special care for a person in need. He knew that Timothy was going to be faced with some really taxing situations for Timothy. Perhaps they're going to bring him to the end of himself. Create exhausting relationship dramas. He needed to know that God's special care would be available to him and that God would help him where he felt like he had no help. God wanted Timothy to receive mercy to minister to him in his distress. And the last one is this, peace was the third blessing. That's the peace, not just peace with God, but it also speaks to inner peace when living in times of trouble. Paul wanted for Timothy to experience tranquility and well-being and relational peace with others, even as he would be challenging and calling the church to hold their ground in the gospel ministry and to not allow people to distract them or get led astray from genuine faith and love. And his blessings reminds Timothy that God is the source of all of these things, and he has an infinite supply, Timothy. <clears throat> Nothing provides comfort for a child of God more than the promise of God's presence and blessings. Nothing. But second to that is knowing that other people understand you, they see you, they care about what you're going through, knowing that your burdens aren't yours alone to carry, that you're not alone with it, that you're not alone with the weight, the heaviness, Knowing that God and your faith family has your back in thick or thin, in success or failure. Fellowship like that emboldens and strengthens believers. And we give that to each other. And the last one is this, and we're going to spend the rest of the time on it. By love, we, we love by always speaking and teaching the truth. Y'all hang with me here, and I'll try to get you through this. So Paul's love for the church, for those who have not yet heard the gospel, it leads him to dispatch Timothy to head off some wolves that were operating among the leadership in the church of Ephesus. Read what he says in verses 3 through 7. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love, that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding 
either with what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So what was happening? Let me kind of give you the rundown on it. False teaching by certain men were being spread. When he says certain men, that means these are identifiable people. They know who they are. We assume that some of these leaders who he's talking about that were known by Timothy and others, they were actually elders of some of the house churches in Ephesus. And Paul had warned in Acts 20, there would be wolves from among you that would rise up. We assume they're also elders because they say that they want to be teachers of the law, and we know that that was reserved for an elder responsibility and role. And most of, much of the letter of Timothy is devoted to elders' roles and discipline in the church. So this wasn't just a few confused, immature church members. These were leaders, so this was like a whole church problem. These men had wandered away from the motivation of love fueled by the message of the faith alone gospel. And they had turned to meaningless, vain discussions. It says that they wanted to be teachers of the law. That was like they wanted to be like rabbis, like Jewish rabbis. So they, they wanted to be like these Christian versions of rabbis. They wanted to pose as having authoritative insight, teaching into the deeper things of Scripture. The problem is, is they would speak dogmatically out of their ignorance. They invented myths about obscure people and events as they would find gaps in the genealogies. They added extra biblical teaching, history. They would give meanings to things that had really no meaning and they were inventing. Here's the thing about these guys, though. They were not trying to teach salvation by law. They probably didn't even set out, they definitely didn't set out to be heretical. They just wanted to go deeper into the things of Scripture. They wanted to go beyond the simple gospel and the instructions of Paul. They wanted to give all these different, profound, all-inspiring truths for people. And here's why they wanted to do it. The motivation? They wanted personal accolades and to feed their ego. They weren't setting out to really abandon the faith alone doctrine. But what they were doing was they were smothering the message by all of these other meaningless conversations and pursuits. Here's what Paul said about it. He says that it promotes controversies rather than God's work, rather than obedience being the result of these teachings. All it was producing was fruitless arguments, debates, doubts, questioning. It birthed snobbery, intellectual elitism. These are the things that this was, ha was happening in the church. They had wandered away from love into controversy, away from pure hearts and good consciences to duplicity and religious insincerity. That happens a lot in churches. It can easily happen in our life groups, where going deeper becomes the mantra, right? Oh, we're just going to get in, we're going to get, get deeper. And that's great, but a lot of times, if we're not paying attention, there, it's also an indication sometimes the way that we're thinking is we're turning more inward than outward. And if, if we're not careful, it actually becomes a way to ignore and excuse ourselves from being responsible for the development and maturity and the gospel message of young believers or of reaching out to unbelievers and being evangelistic. If you're not careful, it'll shut you down. And this idea where we're going deeper, when really what you're doing is distracting yourself and you're swimming in the shallow end of the pool, you're not deep at all. Because if it's not leading to obedience and the fellowship of Jesus, if it's not leading to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if love is not what is produced by your going into the word of God, you're going at it wrong. So why guard the, tr the truth? Here's why. Because you can give truth without love, but you cannot give genuine love without truth. 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us in verses 1 through 3, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver my body up to be burned but I have not love, I gain nothing. Any real experience of love is built on the foundation of truth. Outside of that, you're building on fantasy and falsehoods. 
self-serving motivations rather than pure love and care and pleasure in the good of another person. When I find value in another person, when I do care about their well-being and their good, I recognize that ultimately that can't be experienced outside of a relationship with God or a life lived in alignment with God's rule and purposes for that person's life. And so what I recognize is that truth is always our friend. Truth is always your friend. And God is the greatest reality and he is the source of all truth. So adjusting our lives to live according to God's word as he puts it before us, it leads to life. It leads to productivity. It leads to growth. It leads to all the good stuff. Guys, if I love you, I will not passively or actively participate in your making decisions from lies, sinful desires, ignorance, and misconceptions. I won't participate in that. To accommodate a person's fantasy life, to turn a blind eye to their denial of reality and truth and God's ways in order to not lose the friendship, in order to not offend them or push them away. That is not love for the other person. That is love for yourself, and it's protecting your own loss or your own discomfort. Speaking truth is important, and it's a way that we love. But here's the thing. But you do not speak that truth without love as the sole motivation. Because truth without love is dogmatism. Love without truth is selfish sentimentality. But speaking the truth in love is Christianity. And that's what we're commanded to do. Paul said to Timothy to confront those men, to rebuke them, to correct them. But the motivation of that hard confrontation coming from young Tim and Timothy was to be love. Love for them and understanding that if they return to sound doctrine, it would restore the outpouring of love to other people. Correction that comes from love comes from an inner condition. Let me give you these really quick. It says it there in the passage. It comes from a pure heart, first of all. That means a heart that's clean from sin, that's acting in obedience to God. It's love for God first and then a sincere love for those around us. You know, that's what Jesus taught, right? That all the law, all the prophets, all of our fellowship of God hangs on two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And out of that, love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else hangs on those two things. And love for God makes possible and fuels love for people. And also a good conscience. A position in which neither God nor self condemns oneself. We're free of guilt and doubt and shame. There's a sense of moral approval from God and from God's people. A good conscience. And a sincere faith. That's true faith. That's one without pretense or hypocrisy. Real faith joins naturally with love. Those two things can't be divorced. Love produces Our faith produces that when we're following God. And all of those things have their foundation in our salvation in Christ. So we do speak the truth. And here's what I want to kind of talk to us a little bit about to to wrap this up. Listen, direct, loving criticism, reflections, corrections, those are necessary as a part of our spiritual growth and right living. We need relationships that have both total acceptance and clear honesty happening. So we can't be afraid of the truth. It, it may hurt. You know, some people are like, well, the truth hurts. Well, we're not saying that out of spite. Yeah, it can hurt, but it also heals, right? It doesn't harm. It may hurt. It doesn't harm, but it brings healing. And we're to bring truth into all of our relationships in this fellowship. And the primary source of that is God's word. He's the authority of truth. Now, we can also speak from experiences. We can point out observations of cause and effect behaviors or unhealthy things that we see happening in the life of a brother or sister. But we all need to be looking to the word of God as the replacement for those lies, for for those sins, for those misconceptions, for the broken things, for the reactions, so that we can build our lives on truth. And God's word is true. And when we align with it, that is where growth happens. That's where strength comes from. That's where freedom is experienced. 
God's sincere love for one another would desire nothing less than to see the ongoing growth and experiencing of life as God designed it to be in the life of one another. And at the heart of this is that word that Paul brought up last week, and that's the word doctrine. Doctrine is at the heart of practical living, the cultivation of a transforming love, the experiencing of that. What we know and what we truly believe has everything to do with how we think, how we live, how we solve problems, how we navigate relationships and conflicts, what we see as our purpose and motivations, what we give value to, how we see people, what we do and how we respond in the midst of trials and struggles and losses. Biblical doctrines, knowing the truth of God's word has everything to do with that. We need accurate teaching on who God is, on Christ, on man, on sin, on salvation, on the church, on the future. Those are all essential to building our lives on, to building a real love on. And walking in light of truth and leading one another to stay on that path, that is the most loving expression we can do for one another. Now, we're not to stand for doctrine as like a matter of pride. And we're not to use it like a hammer at the head of everyone else. But we are to teach with love and to teach desiring that the blind would see, that the ignorant would be enlightened, that the wounded would be healed, that the lost would be found, that the young and the faith would be brought to maturity. That's our goal. We love with truth. I want to end with this. Before Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, he had penned words to the Ephesian believers. And in that letter, he, he expressed what it means to be a growing body and how that comes about. And a couple of years in, he felt the need to then write Timothy because the things he had instructed them to do was obviously going sideways. And now he's calling on Timothy to do the thing that he had told them needed to happen in order for the church to thrive in the world. Here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. It says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, here's the solution, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, and meaning all of us are a part of this equation, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When we are loving rightly, when we're walking in truth together, when we're holding the gospel identity in front of each other, that's what happens. God's plan for me and you, for all the creation, is to return everything back to its rightful order. Everything that sin broke, God is restoring. And for us, that's that, that idea of sanctification. Because we're not as we were meant to be. And God is in this process of restoring us. He's teaching us to return to him as the source of all life. And he puts us back in right relationship with himself. But then he also is restoring how we rightly connect and experience one another. He stresses love. Treating others as equals with worth. Caring for one another. Forgiving one another. Healing one another. Teaching one another. Correcting one another. And we don't place ourselves above any other person. We identify as a fellow sinner, a fellow struggler, realizing that we're just as prone to temptation as the next person. We don't condemn another person by the law or shame, and we don't make up our own standards. We humbly bow to God's standard in evaluating each other and calling each other to repentance. This faith family experience 
is meant to provide all of us with what we need to love and to grow and mature and become everything that God wants us to be. You know, when we talk about loving with truth, there's a difference in, in head knowledge and heart knowledge. They work differently. And we need both. The head works with information gathering. Right? And we give that when we are teaching the gospel and solid doctrine and truth. But the heart works with experience gathering. With experiencing love. So while the head knowledge is giving the truth and giving God gospel doctrine and teaching an untainted word of God that knowing intellectually begins only to make its way down into the souls of us in the context of experiencing a love that is accepting that's affirming that's validating that's comforting that's encouraging in the context of relationship with other people where we are known where we're seen where we are unjudged where we're understood where we're cared for, where we feel valued, imperfections and all. In the context of that kind of love, that truth can make its way down into me. That is where truth sinks into the heart. That's where change and growth happens. And that's what we're called to be as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the church. Because love informed and founded on the truth is the ultimate fertilizer to growth and sanctification for every believer individually and collectively as the body of Christ. When love rules our relationships, we become a powerful, attractive force for the kingdom of God in the world. We become a transforming relationship, family experience. For everyone. Would you guys pray with me? In a moment, I'm going to do something a little bit differently this morning. I'm going to instruct us to minister to one another and to practice loving each other. And so I'm going to make us all have a, maybe a, a little awkward moment with the people sitting next to us. <clears throat> you can, my email address is Paul Thompson at Calvary Baptist <laughs> Church. Let me pray for us and I'm going to give us some instruction. Father, we love because you first loved us. We all sit in this room as adopted sons and daughters. None of us deserve to be in your family. We know that we're sinners. We know that we're frail. We know that we wander so easily. But your love is changing us. It's saved us. It's redeeming us. Your love is making us new every day. You give us grace upon grace. You give us mercy. You give us peace. And Lord, you call us to love each other just as we are experiencing your love. And we confess to you today, God, that we, we just don't get that right a lot. That it's so easy, God, for us to go through a week, even a month, whatever, just focused on ourselves, getting some task done, working out some problem or issue. And those things matter. They matter to you. But Father, other people have to matter to us too. We need each other. We were made to have relationships to need relationship. Not just any kind of relationship, God loving, caring, 
accepting relationships. Where truth rules and reigns in our conversation, your truth, not ours, what you said, that we call each other to submit, to follow you, to trust you. Father, I believe there may be some people in this room, their people vitamins are running low. They may sit in a big room surrounded by people, but right now maybe they feel all alone. They feel unknown. They feel uncared for. And Father, when we feel that way, I know we focus on ourselves. I pray, God, that those people would know they can reach out to a brother or sister next to them and say, here's what I need. Here's what's going on. And God, you would pour your love out through one another to help, to bring comfort and encouragement, to bring healing. God, I pray that you would let this church, if nothing else characterizes us, I pray that when someone encounters us, they feel love and they feel your love. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to.